Ja, herzlich willkommen alle miteinander. Ich werde jetzt dann auf Englisch switchen, um, da auch der Vortrag auf Englisch ist. So, welcome everybody. I'm very happy to see you all here. Happy to see that you've all found the way, even, to the, even despite these unforeseen circumstances. We are very happy to welcome you all here to this event to this lecture by Duruba al-Mujahid bin Wahab, the veteran of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and Black Liberation Army under the title Organize Against the Resurgence of Racist Right-Wing Politics as Neoliberal Reform. This is an event organized by Dada Janoub and the Kommunistische Jugend Österreichs, the Communist Youth of Austria, my name is Leo, I am here on behalf of the Communist Youth, and here with me is Amina from Dara Janu. Uh, yeah, again, very happy to see you all here. I will now be saying some words on behalf of Kyoto. We young communists are very happy to be able to hear Daruba speak here in Austria. This is for several reasons. The first is that he is a rich source of experience when it comes to what it means to organize for a revolution in the center of the imperial world order in the belly of the beast. The history and successes of the Black Panther Party are an example worth studying to all of us. The same is true of the massive state crackdown on the Black Panther Party and its activists, Duruba among them. If we learn successfully from the Black Panther Party's successes, we also have to learn from the other side. We have to know what to expect and how to deal with it. On a more personal level for all of us, there are several ways in which we can, which is an example for us. For one, he is not afraid to speak his mind, even if what he says goes against the hegemonic narrative because it, it attacks the ruling class of the imperialist center and those who cooperate with it. Even more, on these occasions, he does not try to avoid confrontation and frank discussion with those trying to enforce what is and what is not allowed to be said. Looking towards the future, the rumor shows us what it means to be a lifelong revolutionary. We are not communists because it is some rebellious phase of ours. We do not want to fall back in line later in our adult years and offer our tacit support to our exploiters in return for some crumbs off their table. We see our time in the communist youth as preparation for a life of struggle. And Daruba is one of the people we can look to to see what that means, a life of struggle. Thank you. Uh... Now I would like to ask Markus from Dara Janoub to the stage. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim We would like to apologize for the late start and the change of the location at short notice. The reason for this is that the University of Vienna wants to continue its deeply racist tradition by refusing to allow the Ruba Bidwahab to speak at the university. Just as the University of Vienna and its student body were on the wrong side of the history in 1914 and 1938. They are on the wrong side today. To hell with this institution and fight Pastner from the event management. You are a piece of dog shit. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Ruba 
always reminds us to be polite. <laughs> we and Large and Loop, in cooperation with the Communist Jews in Austria, want to say thank you to the organizers of this event as a school, and thank you to all the helping hands and supporters in front and, of, and behind the scene. Thank you again to the Kajat Ö in Vienna. Thank you to the Migrantifa in Berlin. Thank you to the Black African Diaspora United Berlin. Thank you to the Parti de l'Indigène de la République in Paris. And thank you to the Friends for Non Foundation in Paris. And thank you to the students against right wing defamation in Frankfurt. And thank you to the La Rosa Primavera. Radio La Rosa, Campania in Lotta and Rome. We send warm greetings to the activists in the BDS movement and to the activists and the Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network, Sami Dun. And we send more sincere greetings to all the young cats, young bloods, as Shabaab, in the streets of Europe, who were forced by Western policies to leave their families and countries and are now resisting institutionalized, organized racism here in Europe. It's a great honor to welcome you, Duruba, here in Vienna today and again. You have made the journey into the hearts of the European peace under not so easy circumstances, but you never took it easy and you never retired, but for you to speak in here cannot be taken for granted. You are here with us and for us to speak truth to people, not truth to power. The power wants to silence you. It is not an easy task to introduce to Ruhu Bibahat from his and those from his generation. As let us know, history is, those written, is written by those who put Duruba in prison and imprisoned Mumia, Imam Jamil, Raja Singh Maggi, and Dr. Motula Shakur until this very day. Let's try anyway. Duruba al Mujahid, born in the storm, escaped the plantation, never returned to the plantation. Field Secretary in the party, soldier in the army. Survived the torture, survived to continue working, organizing in a totally different world of individualism and without leadership. The Ruba OG Al Ad, mentor, advisor, maybe brother. Darker than blue, father of Saif, Duruba, and Mumu, Pan-African, African, deeply connected with the tip of Africa, Palestine, a lever in one book. Duruba never made, never made peace with the enemy, never humanized the enemy, or, as his sister Asata Shakur says, a pig is a pig. Boycotted by the media, defamed by the institutions, writer, analyst, activist, scholar. Duruva the Panther is back, but he was never actually gone. Because you, Duruva, always leave a legacy behind. To those who look for answers, like us, like we, and those white and non-white who fear your answers and then talk behind your back. The latter run miles to escape you, but the reality you describe catches them again. Yoruba and those of his generation felt, difference, felt the difference between patience and cowardice, or like Martyr George Jackson, God have mercy on him, said, Patience has its limits. Take it too far and it's cowardice. 
Tuluva and those of his generation, if you look for them in the world, they are always gone. And some may think that Tuluva comes from a defeated movement. And if you measure victory or defeat by the existence of the Black Panther Party for self-defense, the fact is that this party and other formations no longer exist. But in the short time of its existence, this organization has inscribed itself deeply into history, so deeply that the decades-long hybrid war against the party and the army and its activists could not make these traces invisible. The idea of realizing a life of dignity and justice has survived. Otherwise, we would not be here today with the Rue Bidoha. Jean-Marc Rouillon, former political prisoner in France, says about Yoruba, Yoruba Bidoha today is a black leader. He is neither a retired revolutionary nor nostalgic, grounded in his militant history in the US, he acts against current capitalism, current imperialism, and its mode of global production. Professor Dr. Ward Churchill says about the Ruba, he is loud, he is clear, and he has, he has to be. This is how he survived. And this week, the Ruba will speak and discuss in the hearts of the European peace. After Vienna, he will visit Berlin, Frankfurt, Rome, Paris. He will speak to and discuss with activists about the current political situations. First, from his historical background, and second, from the perspective, perspective of the Global South. This background is rooted in a time when politics were connected with responsibility, not with identity. And this responsibility led to consequences. Last but not least, we want to mention that the political prisoners in the USA, in the European Union, and in the Zionist settler state, Israel, needs our support. If we ignore them, we ignore history. Glory and mercy to the martyrs, freedom for the prisoners. Ruba, we love you, and we will never give up to confront ourselves with the history of you and your generation. Thank you. Our speaker tonight doesn't need much introduction, but for those of you who don't know him, Tuluba bin Wahad is a former member of, uh, the, of, the, Black, uh, sorry, of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, which was first founded in 1966 in Oakland, California by Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton. Tuluba is also co-founder of the uh, Black Liberation Army uh, like many of his comrades, he was held captive in the dungeons of the United States for 19 years. For 19 years, he was imprisoned by the brutal American settler empire that is in fear of powerful voices such as Duruba, Durubas, and others who dare to challenge the system of global oppression. After having faced the colonial beast in the heart of Europe in 2018 and 2020, we once again, we once again have the privilege and honor to have him here, to talk to us, to enlighten us, to challenge and confront us with his history and the history of a radical black movement that brought to life or revived a movement of international solidarity and earnest political work from which we can draw inspiration and learn from for our generation and many generations to come. There is a lot more to be said about him, but now it's time to hear from Duruba himself. Please, everybody, welcome Duruba and Mujahid in Wahad. Thank you. 
I see y'all have me. First of all, I want to thank my hosts, um, who, uh, you know, they've been wonderful to me. They've been very considerate. Um, and <clears throat> I want to uh, send my uh, appreciation uh, to everyone here who, uh, in such short notice, y'all managed to, you know, flip the script and wind up here. This is the, this is the second time this happened. The first time they did the same thing. And I believe we were here the second time as well. Yeah, yeah. But I just want to say I'm, I'm, very, I'm very honored and, um, and humbled to be able to come and talk to you, talk to young people about the um, future that we face, some of, the map, some of the actions that we could take today that might alter uh, the course of history. But most of all, um, I want to say that whatever um, ideological persuasion we may think we're following, whatever religious um, practices and theological propositions we believe in, I think everyone here wants to be desires to be on the right side of history. To be on the right side of history doesn't mean we all have to think the same. To be on the right side of history doesn't mean we all have to look alike, behave in ways that others may find a little, you know, risque or whatever, dress alike. It means that we have to have an appreciation for the truth, a respect for reality and each other. And most of all, a deep abiding faith in the ultimate dignity of the human spirit. I think that we don't really appreciate that humanity has been created in such diversity, with such richness, that it impels us as individuals to learn about each other, not despise each other. I think that's very important. But it's also important to understand that amongst the human species, there are those who have no concern, consideration, or appreciation of the rest of humanity. They only are concerned with themselves with their circle of friends and their extended family and their interests and their money and their property. So those are the things that they worship. Those are the issues that are before us today. Someone wrote a poem, I can't remember who, I believe it was Palestinian, it was called Enemies of the Sun. Now, are you, any of you familiar with that poem? And it was, it was a Palestinian that wrote it, wasn't it? Absolutely. Charles Say again. I think Charles Jackson. Yes. Well. No, uh, he wrote about it. He heard about it and then he, he made it famous that it was a Palestinian prisoner. Yeah. yeah. In the spirit of that, 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 that verse, really draws attention See, there are those who represent a spirit, an energy of destruction and chaos and mayhem and misery and pain. They bring it with them. Do you see? There are those who are enemies of this planet, who are enemies of creation. And they'll never be on the right side of history as long as there's a history to be written. 
So I want to address what the subject of this, this gathering was supposed to be about, which was, um, how do I get this stuff off my page? <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so I want to address the matters that are really in front of us today. We are living in a very difficult time. The manipulation of human social consciousness, of the herd instinct of our social being, is what undergirds the mob mentality that collectively we will react violently to those things and issues and others who we feel threaten us, who we feel make us feel insecure. The manipulation of the masses of people has become a science. But at the turn of the 20th century, understanding human mass consciousness was in its early infancy. I mean, there were a lot of, you know, behavioral scientists and everything and, and uh, social scientists. But what interested some of the uh, philosophers of the early 20th century was that the fact was the fact that people could act so irrationally and against their own self-interest based on lies, myths, and conspiracy theories. And that we know from from the from the rise of the Nazi of Nazi Germany and um, uh, their use of propaganda, they honed the the technique of telling lies in such prodigious amounts and repeating those lies over and over again until the people believed what they were saying. And when the people started to believe these lies and these myths based on what they were told was the cause for their misery. At the end of World War I, after the Treaty of Versailles was signed, Germany was plunged into an unprecedented economic depression. It had to pay reparations for the war. Unemployment was over 50%. The returning veterans from the war had no jobs. People were sleeping in the streets, begging. And there were different political parties in groups trying to organize the people around their own ideological interpretation of the conditions that they were in. And um, World War I, for as an aside, just in case um, people won't get confused here, was the first industrial war. It was the first war of the industrial age. People were massacred and murdered on an industrial level, literally. Weapons of mass destruction were being developed, early weapons of mass destruction, chemical, chemical poison the use of different types of explosives, 
cannons that could shoot for miles and land in urban areas and kill people. The weapons of mass destruction were being developed and they were employed as the empires of Europe began to fall apart. And all of the people started to clamor for their own self-determination. The subject people of, of the German empires, of the Habsburgs, and, the, and the, the subject people of the Tsar's empire, the Russian empire, Soviet, well, Soviets hadn't come into existence yet, but those, those societies who were defeated, those nations who were defeated in World War I, felt that they were betrayed, that they were victimized, that they were actually the victims of their own aggressions and their own excesses. And it was this sense of victimization, of suffering, of betrayal, that dictators arose to tell the people that you are being humiliated, you are being spat upon because you are, in reality, superior to everyone who is treating you this way. You are of the great Germanic people. Hmm? Warriors who have a deep history and tradition going all the way back to Beowulf and, and, uh, and the Black Forest and all that stuff. You see? You were descendants of God, of Thor. And these people were maggots. They were inferior. But they got the upper hand right now. But we're going to take back our divine destiny. Out of World War I arose modern nationalism. Nation states began to emerge that hadn't existed before who were basically suppressed, different ethnic peoples who were suppressed wanted their self-determination. Everyone was clamoring for their own self-determination. The empires had collapsed, the armies that were defeated were defeated. What was going to happen? So there was this guy, this um, uh, professor, I believe his name was Gustave Le Bon. Any of you read him? Well, he was a philosopher. He, he, he was kind of like a psychologist, a philosopher, a sci um, social scientist, all rolled up into one. And he wrote a book called The Crowd. And what he said in this book was very, very important. And that's one of the reasons why I said to, me, to you that the herd instinct, our social being, we are social animals, we are social mammals, and we can be easily manipulated. We can be readily deceived if a system develops the capacity to transform perception into reality despite the unreality of the perception. That's, that sounds kind of convoluted, right? So, well, well, what I mean is, LeBron said, and I, some of this I, I disagree with, he proclaimed that the 19th century was the century of individualism, liberalism. And therefore, he expected the 20th century 
would be the century of collectivism, and hence the century of the state. Not the empire, the state. And he went on to say that, that although the century of the lib liberalism of the 19th century, and of course we know the 19th century was a century in which um, uh, empires and kings and queens rule. I don't, I don't know where he, what he's talking about individualism. People were living in, in hovels and in ghettos and industrialization had passed by. Uh, there was uh, uh, past working people by and I mean, I don't know what he's talking about, individ individualism. But this was for the purposes of his proposition. And LeBond believed that a strong attract, that the strong attraction of Marxism, but you see, the fascists, both Mussolini and 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 and, um, and Hitler, but especially Mussolini, they all reversed or inversed Marxism to suit their national identity and purpose. So they basically were saying Marx is right about the power of the masses, of the working class. And he's right. But LeBron said he's right, but one thing he realized based on the mammalian tendency to act as a herd when in a crowd was that they could be made to believe anything when they're in that state. And in fact, they'll reject the truth in favor of a lie if it reaffirms and self-affirms their own feelings of inadequacy and powerlessness. Think about that. LeBon believed the strong attraction of Marxism in the early years of industrialization, its resilience on the industrial working class, its reliance on the industrial working class, was the basis in part on the homogeneity of or one-sidedness of public socialism, both of whom advocated social nationalism as an anathema to Bolshevism. Now what I'm trying to say is one of the things that the early fascists hated, one ideology they despised was Bolshevism, communism. Now you say, well, how could they come from Marx and despise communism? Well, there were two trends to, to those who follow Marx's analysis, class analysis of industri early industrial society, his analysis of empires, of nobility. Marx was pretty clear on all of that stuff. But there was one trend that was picked up by Lenin. And then there was another darker, deeper, and more sinister uh, track that was picked up by Mussolini. And it came through this guy, LeBron, whom he read, and like the bell went off in his head, ding! If you lie to the people, and you tell them a lie that reinforces their own self-esteem and self and self-existence, then they will follow you anywhere. Because they would believe that this is what they have to do to verify and sustain themselves. He maintained that nationalism had to develop almost a divine, divine, a spiritual, a spiritual attraction. You could not only believe, you, can, you could not only just believe in the, in the state, you had to believe 
in the greatness of the people that make the state. You had to have manifest destiny. Hmm? Wasn't that like the, 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 uh, the mantra of the British and the, and the, and the um, Spanish empires and nobility, manifest destiny? You know, this was ordained by God. What do the Americans say about their constitution? It was divinely inspired. These nations, these nation states, Bond realized, were, were con constructs that had to look to the past in order to verify the greatness of the present, regardless what the conditions of the present were. So when Mussolini came to power, but as Mussolini began to organize, he began to organize who? The working class. He organized them around their own self-interest. The working class needed to have a voice. They needed to be able to uh, have power. But even more than that, they had to recoup the glory that was wrong. Because Tuscans were fighting with, with, with those from southern Italy. There were those in the northern Italy who wanted their own autonomy. There were, and this was after the war. Okay? Everybody wanted their own self-determination. And they felt this was the opportunity to get it now. The Ottoman Empire was gone. The Habsburgs and, 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 and all these old empires had, had, had broken. The Tsar was defeated. So everybody that spoke a particular language felt that they had a right to self-determination. And the only way to pull them together was to sell them a dream, a myth. And the myth for the Italians was to recapture the glory that was wrong, the greatness that was wrong, because you are the Roman people, and you were destined to be great again. You see? So you tell them a whole bunch of myths. And Le Bon, in his writings on the psychology of the mob, his seminal work, The Crowd, explained that the latent power of plenty of stupid or ignorant people, when manipulated by lies and untruths, can reinforce their own emotions of irrelevancy. In other words, there's power in plenty of stupid people. <laughs> Never underestimate the power of plenty of dumb motherfuckers. <laughs> and so Mussolini he moved on this sense of transforming collectivism and the psychological law of mental unity of the crowd. So you have to constantly raise those cultural icons and those social uh, um, uh, uh, myths that draw people together. You know. We, we always had these freedoms. The family was the center of everything. And we had the, 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 the leader or the patriarch, he was here, and he, was, he had his consul of, of wise men, and this is how we became great, you see? So people begin to organize themselves around the myths of their own greatness. In America, they'll tell you that you know, when, when, when a white supremacist goes on a rampage and kills 10 or 11 black people, white politicians get up in front of the microphone and say, this is not who we are. <laughs> this is not America. Oh, <laughs> how did we get here? <laughs> you, mean, you mean killing people of color indiscriminately in a church is not American? Oh? 
<laughs> well, I mean, you know, destroying families and institutionalizing poverty is un-American? Really? So they have to believe these myths. George Washington never lied. He, he didn't cut down the cherry tree. He said, I can never tell a lie. No, but George Washington owned human beings. He owned my ancestors. Hmm? All of the founding, quote, fathers did. You notice they don't never say founding mothers. Because back then, women didn't count neither. Don't, don't get it twisted. Don't be. <laughs> so, when we talk about our history by, through the educational system, and what does Marx say, oh, was it Lenin? No, it was um, Engels, I believe, said that education is the, the means by which, or the institution by which, the ruling class trains the masses of people into their own values and standards. So we go to school to learn how to be good what? Austrian citizen. You see? So. The fact that we had a homeboy here named Adolf, hey, that was an aberration. You know, don't hold us all guilty for that guy. We didn't do that. Well, same thing they say about George Washington, right? The same thing they say about the four. Man, come on, man. That was back then. The Constitution was made to empower everyone. So you have these judges that sit around and determine the Constitution and all of this stuff. My point is that the modern nation state that we know today is the national security state, that in America has become a garrison state, is a white supremacist construct that relied upon the brutalization, the murder, and the exploitation of people of color and of people that we call today the third world. You would not have a state in this fashion and this form if this history didn't occur. Now some states, you know, had a little more skin in the game than others. So you know, when, when the old hag in London kicked it off, <laughs> the law called her back, and they said, you ain't got no Sam Sam tree here, girlfriend. You ain't, you ain't gonna sit up under no tree here for paradise. In fact, you see that Ebo mask over there? You know, you know the Ebo, don't you? They the ones that you colonized. They the ones that you brutalized. They the ones that you exterminated. Hmm? So, you know, it never occurred to a lot of Europeans and those in, um, in Britain, that there might be people that were applauding her passing. They really didn't care about it either way. But if you voice that, if you challenge that myth, then you are blaspheming. You can only blaspheme when it comes to religion and the national security state has become a religion. It's, even, it's stricter and more powerful than the Catholic Church. It serves almost the same purpose that the Catholic Church served in the medieval Europe in terms of uniting all the knights that were killing each other and sending them off to kill Muslims. Say, look, man, y'all got to stop this stuff storming the castle and, you know, King Beauregard is, you know, uh, pillaging, you know, Prince Henry's property and, you know, y'all going back and forth fighting in the, you know, come on, man, y 
y'all got to chill with that. You see them? You see them folks over there? Talking about Lahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. You see them? And those are the ones you need to you need to get to get with because they're occupying the holy places. And you know you're all good Christians, you know, despite your differences. So y'all need to put on the cross, King Beauregard, Prince, Prince Fauntleroy, and all y'all need to get on your armored horses and go over there and rid them infidels, run them infidels out of the holy city of Jerusalem. So they had so many crusades, you know, some succeeded to a bit, but they all failed, ultimately. But Europe was unified, or the nobility in Europe, the ones that were running everything, were unified in a certain type of internationalism at that moment, and it was focused against others who threatened their very existence or perception of their existence. And this process was repeated again and again in Europe. It was repeated over and over in Europe. At the end of World War I, to combat this collective sense of individuality of nations who wanted their own self-determination, the elite and the victors of World War I organized the League of Nations. They declared internationalism would stop wars. We all had to be responsible nations. We had to respect each other's sovereignty each other's territorial interests, each other's colonies. So we have the League of Nations. And when we were disputing you know, how we're going to carve up the Ottoman Empire, now that it's defeated, we'll have a um, protectorate, a, you know, to govern the areas until we can figure out what we're going to do with it. A mandate. And that mandate was put in a strategic area that straddled the oil-rich Middle East was Palestine. And then, you know, everybody said, okay, cool, we, we, we good with that. We got the Palestine, Palestinian man. There ain't nobody really own that, you know, because we ain't figured out what, you know. The French said, okay, the French got Lebanon, and the French got, and, and got Syria, and the British got, you know, everybody got their own little piece. You know, white folks is deep, man. They'll divvy up everything. You, know, you, you remember the Berlin Conference? They just said, okay, okay, you want the Congo? Okay, you got it. Oh, uh, now you, oh, oh, I know, you like that, you like that, those, that fishing stuff on the West Coast. Okay, so you got Guinea, and you got, okay, me, I'll take North Africa. Okay, we good? We all good? Yeah, we good. Okay, so we ain't gonna be shooting at each other now when if you find gold over there, we just work it out, <coughs> right? So they just cut up everything. But, but Palestine was a League of Nations mandate, because they didn't figure out after they divvied up everything, who was going to get it? Nobody, and the British knew that they already had a deal under the table, Balfour Agreement. And they had a deal with these Zionists who helped win the war. I mean, the Rothschilds helped win the war. Because it was Rothschilds on both sides <laughs> of the war. You know, they played both ends against the middle and came out on top. You know, so. I said, OK, cool. Um, but you got all these people clamoring to be a nation, be nations, you know. All these obscure folks, they're speaking all these dialects and stuff. They want to be, you know, they want self-determination. How are we going to deal with that? Well, we declare internationalism as, you know, to rule us all. Internationalism, they're just the League of Nations. How long did the League of Nations last? Not long. When the Japanese decided to walk out, you know, they said, man, you know, Asia for the Asiatics. <laughs> Check this out. Japanese imperialism used European imperialism as the basis for them invading China, <laughs> taking the resources of Burma, and doing all of these atrocious things to other Asians. Because, you know, 
We all look alike. You know, look at them British, man. You know, have you ever seen anybody looking like these people? You see? And here they are running everything in Hong Kong and running everything in Shanghai, and the Chinese are coolies and have no power. You know, Asia for the Asiatics. So here comes the Japanese army. And then in this League of Nations, you know, the Americans say, well, first of all, man, y'all got to, we got to put a check on these Japanese, you know, because they, they like the yellow peril. So all the Europeans agree, yeah, 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 we got to put some type of sanctions on Japan. So they sanctioned Japan for invading, for invading China in Shanghai. In Shanghai was, I think it was 1929 and 1930. Okay? Japanese said, okay, you can take your sanctions and shove them up your ass. We out of here. So the League of Nations say, well, man, if they could do that, that means, well, Germans say, oh, shit, if they out of here, we out of here. You say, well, wait, oh, hold up. Everybody can't bounce on the League of Nations. So yes, we can. You let them do it. So the League of Nations wasn't going to work. It was a stopgap. And so once the League of Nations was dissolved, Germany began its campaign to build up its arm armaments and its arsenal and its industry on the down low. They began to finagle loans from these Swiss banks to finance programs that they could front off and use to train their fighter pilots to buy the necessary raw material to make tanks. And by 19, I believe it was 1938, 1939, the German Wehrmacht was the most powerful modern army in Europe. But everybody didn't know that. They slipped it on on the down low ski. You know, they said, we. Well, Fight no, we ain't got no fighter planes. Well, we we banned from Versailles for having these types of weapons. See, we can't have these types of weapons. Well, well, well what's that flying around there? Oh, that's a that's a crop duster. <laughs> that that's to you know spread insecticide on the on the plants. You see, but they don't tell you that the insecticide that they that they spreading on the plants on a fake crop duster is some of the same chemicals they're gonna use in the concentration camp in a few more years, you see. Because they're developing that too, along with the insecticide. You see. So by the time Hitler was able to make his move and move into where we at now? <laughs> yeah, I think it was around here somewhere, right? The first one? To annex Sudetenland, Sudetenland, that was his first move. Because they felt, remember, he had to lie to the people and tell them the greater Germany was betrayed. And one of the major betrayals in World War I was the annexation of Sudetenland. That's not how you pronounce it. But that was the first betrayal. We're going to straighten that right out right now. So they marched in, shoom, 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 took it. Then you look over and say, what they gonna do about it? They ain't gonna do nothing. They ain't gonna do nothing. Well, you know how the bully is in the schoolyard. If you don't whip the bully's ass straight away, he gonna go, for, he, before you know it, he running the whole schoolyard. So you, even if you're the littlest guy, you got to say, the bully got to say to himself, I ain't picking on that little dude. I'm not messing with that little dude because he's going to go all in and he ain't going to quit. Every time he see me, he at it again. Bandage on his head, arm half broke. And he be saying, man, when are you going to quit? He ain't going to quit. You see? So, then comes Poland. Then comes, and we know the story, right? And before we know it, all of the contradictions that, resolved, that, that resided at the end of World War I and that was encoded and institutionalized in the Versailles Treaty was the basis 
and the substance for the next war. And then we repeat ourselves with the end of World War II. And the so-called, we begin the so-called, what I call the, the fake war, the cold war. At the end of World War II, there's only two people standing that have muscle. The United States and the Soviet Union. One has a nuclear weapon, and the other one has the biggest army. Soon, they will get nuclear weapons, too. But that's a whole other matter that we have to go into. I'm trying to say that the contradictions of the previous generation lay the seeds and the basis for the struggles and the wars of the generation that follows. And that under capitalism, that Marx wrote about in the early age of industrialization, War and the threat of war is a profit motive and a profit motivation. Capitalism cannot thrive without war. War is necessary for capitalism to thrive, which means that the political structures that rely on capitalist economics and development are states that have to be in a constant state of war or a readiness for war. Which is why the military budgets in Germany, in America, and in all of these nation states is usually the largest portion of the entire budget is the military. The majority of money in almost every nation state, or at least a significant portion of it, goes to the maintenance and development of the armed agents of the state. It doesn't go into education. It doesn't go into science. Oh, oh it goes into science whenever that science is being used to enhance the capacity of the military. So you have a unity between science and the corporate and corporate interests and the state and the political state. And who controls the political state? Those who control the money. Those who have the power and the resources to empower the state. In other words, Marx's um, owners of the means of production. So in America, we don't have a democracy. You know, there's no such thing as one human being, one person, one vote. No. In America, you have a really a theocracy masquerading as a democracy, and a democracy masquerade and fascism masquerading as electoral politics and democracy. I call it democratic fascism. The delusion of democracy and the reality of the nation state as the ultimate arbiter of power, freedom, and liberty. The state. And the state claims that it's exercising its power in the interests of the people. So we go back to this mob mentality and the mythologies of the state that they have to perpetrate. They have to say, like, you see in Texas now, I'll give you an example, they're, they're going over the history books, and they're taking out the word slave trade. They're taking out the word the transatlantic slave trade. They're taking out the word slave, and they're saying that black people arrived in America through a process of involuntary migration. Involuntary immigration. In other words, we, were, we migrated by force. We migrated by force. I, I, I thought that, what was the slave trade again? You captured the free people. You put them in chains. You 
put them on ships, who were financed and insured by some of the banks that we know today. Deutsche, Deutsche Bank, and, um, Barclays Bank, Standard Charter, you know. England, I think in the last eight or nine years, has just paid off all of the money it owed to those who lost, those families who lost income when, slave, when, when the transatlantic slave trade was declared illegal. They've been paying these people. I lost money when you, when you took all, all of them Africans from me. You know, I ain't gonna never get over that. I've been, I've been broke ever since. <laughs> really. You see? Same thing with the French and Haiti. Haiti has been paying France every year for the success of the Haitian Revolution. <laughs> so when you win, you lose. This is capitalism. This is early mercantilism and the basis for European hegemony and power and global reach. People don't speak English in India because they like the language. They say, man, I got to learn. That's, that English is fly. No. People don't speak Portuguese in Guinea-Bissau. Because like they like they like the they like the way the you know Portuguese sounds. It sounds so like rhythmic, you know. Come on. They were colonized. They were conquered. They were subjugated. And they were exploited. So when we get to now, and migrants from these lands that once were you know, the gem of empires. Europeans are talking about, why, why are you coming here? You know, we can't take you in. If you come in here, you're going to commit crimes. You're going to take jobs from Austrians. You're going to take jobs from Germans. You're going to take jobs from Frenchmen. You're coming here with your strange cultural habits. Your women are covered and, you know, you wear, your head is wrapped up like Caliph the mummy. You know, you, you all are strange. You know, you all don't even speak good French. Who doesn't speak good French? Y'all are like, you know, y'all are just two steps from being barbarians. But you know, this is the new age, so you can't call a spade a spade. You have to call a spade a dark colored car. So, where are these people coming from again? And aren't they coming some, from some of them nations that you diced up and said, okay, you got this, and, and this is yours, you know? So now, those nations have no infrastructure, they have no future for these people, and they want to go to the land where they could make a living, make a life. They speak French. So hey, let me go across the Mediterranean to France. France say, hey man, well, who told you you could get in here? Well, what's up with you? Okay, we speak Italian, you know, so let's, let's try to get in Italy, you know? So, this history is catching up with the West. This pressure is catching up with the West. Every Western nation that has a border, an external border in Europe, is under siege by masses of people from the colonized territories of the third world that they created, the destitute territories that they managed for over a century. but they're not wanted in Europe. And you have an entire political movement, a sentiment, a mob, a herd mentality that's erected in every metropole in the West and is gaining increasing power and influence because of what? Mass media, social media, Carmel Cuban's 
global village is where we live today. Instant communications. So a lie can be circulated in a heartbeat. And millions of people will read that lie and read into that lie their own reality and believe that lie based on what they think about themselves. Man, if Mussolini had TikTok, he's rolling in his grave right now. Damn, Facebook? You know what I could do with Facebook? Yo, Duce, look, I got some game for him. You know, he had game. Your homeboy Adolf, he mesmerized the whole nation just with his rap. <laughs> he didn't even have uh, uh, Instagram or TikTok or, or, or WhatsApp. He did this straight, no chaser. <laughs> You seen those rallies at Nuremberg? Thousands and thousands of people mesmerized in, in lockstep with this guy. And he's just rocking them back and forth, taking them here, taking them there. You know, he played them like Tchaikovsky played the symphony. And he led them to their doom. So now, we have the technology that allows those who are in power to do this, the same thing, to us. This is why there's culture wars now. A new one generation is in a culture war with the older generation. We have black, we have white elected officials in the United States talking about America is a Christian nation and that they're Christian nationalists. Christian nationalists. Okay? Just keep that in mind, that Christian nationalism, keep it in mind. What was the Nazi party? The national socialist party, wasn't it? Used the word socialist, didn't it use that word? What was, what was Mussolini's party? He used, did this, he used the word socialist. They were the dark side of Marxism. They went for the jugular. They went for mind control. They went for the state being the ultimate arbiter of power and that the corporations and the corporate elite were its managers and supplied the muscle and the wherewithal of the state to make it all powerful. So, when we talk about democracy in Europe and the European Union, you have to ask yourself, um, there was a sister that we talked to last night, she mentioned the fact that it's very hard to organize here. Because um, years ago, um, there, were, there was a vibrant anti-war movement in Europe. You know, like it was in the US at one time. It was a vibrant anti-war movement. But because of the conditions now, that movement doesn't exist. And so wars that are going on in the Ukraine, wars that are going on in the Yemen, Wars that are going on in Syria, wars that are going on in Palestine, on all of these wars, there's no mass of people in the street saying no more war. There are only selective groups of people that go into the street whenever the mass media floats the myth that these are the victims, these are the good guys, and these are the bad guys. So let's get out in the street and Root for the good guys. You see? Putin's the bad guy. Zelensky's the good guy. Ukrainians 
uh, freedom-loving Europeans only desiring self-determination and access to the common market. You know? All they want to do is to be able to buy Apple products, watch Netflix, play soccer, get drunk, and sing their national anthem. And here comes these guys, these Russians, talking about, look, y'all was down with us at one time, and y'all gonna be down with us again. Which is not the purpose, was never the plan. So, where's the peace movement? The United States says that we're going to back the Ukrainians to the last drop of Ukrainian blood. We're going to give them weapons. We're going to give them developed weaponry. Because, you know, the United States is the number one purveyor of weapons in the world. And every diplomatic relationship involves the United States supplying their allies with millions and millions of dollars of advanced weaponry. And this is because America's industry America's corporations are integral are an integral part of its military and its military is necessary for the maintenance of US global hegemony. So, you have an industry whose sole purpose is to make instruments that self-destruct and kill people. They have secret budgets to develop the most advanced weapons of mass destruction. All based on the fact that America is a democracy and has <coughs> interests, strategic interests, wherever its 328 bases are at around the world. And in fact, our greatest enemy is those people that we told you who were the yellow peril at the turn of the century. At the turn of the 19th century, those pioneers who were conquering America called Chinese the yellow peril. And they never expected that China one day would rise up and challenge their global hegemony. They ain't think that was in the cards, you see. But Mao Zedong once said about war, he said, in war, the subjective factor is the dynamic factor. It's the factor that determines the outcome of the war. It's the subjective factor. One army could have a preponderance of weaponry and the best generals and all of these skills, and the other side may not have all that weaponry, but they will fight on an entirely different level than the other side could sustain. This is the reason why the Vietnamese people won the war and ran out the French and the Americans. They didn't get the memo that they were supposed to lose. That, they missed that mem memo. Ho Chi Minh didn't get that. There was a memo that we were supposed to lose? Yeah, we were supposed to lose, man. You know, that's a nuclear power. They have the greatest army. You know, they, were, they got B-52s. They be bombing us for five miles up in the air. We weren't supposed to win this one. Well, so how did they win? The last time I looked, these crackers were going out of Saigon on helicopter skids. They were hanging from the skids, fleeing Saigon the most powerful nation on the planet, were beaten 
by a people who were supposed to be defeated. You see? So my point is, is that now you're in that situation. You are, I think this died. Somebody kicked, somebody pulled the plug. Ah, there we go. It's okay. So you're in that situation now. The masses of people in the nation states of the West far outnumber those who are running the state in their name. But you have no power. They tell you you have to exercise your power peacefully while they have a monopoly on violence. And the monopoly on violence they have is legal. So they tell you you have freedom of speech, but when you speak outside of the parameters of the debate, you could be declared a terrorist, a radical, or any such denigrating name appropriate to diminish what you're saying and smother your freedom of speech. So we know here, for instance, that if you oppose the European settler state of Israel, you'll be declared by the mass media and the establishment and the status quo is anti-Semitic. You're spreading racist, anti-Semitic tropes about the Jewish people. But of course, you never have a discussion about how is that possible when the last time I look, everybody from Israel came from Europe. And uh, I thought Palestine was like where? Oh, the Holy Land. So you have no ethnic, racial tie to that land. You're not Semitic. You, I mean, you're not, I mean, what, what, where was that place you came from? South of the Caucasus? I mean, what, what, what was that name of that place? You're not Semitic. So if I'm anti-Semitic, I would be anti-Palestinian. But that's a whole nother argument. Because the myth of the Israeli state is what counts as reality today. The perception of the Israeli state as a legitimate state is the reality. And I like to remind you that in the 1960s, when the Black Panther Party had its newspaper, the voice of the Black Panther Party, the Community News Service, we published an edition with the headline, Zionism plus racism equals genocide. Then the subtitle was, Zionism plus nationalism equals genocide. So you say to yourself, well, what does that mean? Then history becomes your guide. How did the state come into existence? What was Zionism? Where did it come from? What was its purpose? Why were the Palestinian people made to suffer for the excesses and the genocidal intent of the Nazis and fascist Europe? The Palestinians and the Arabs didn't create Treblinka and Dachau and Buchenwald. It was Europeans. It was Europeans since the age of the Inquisition that consistently, almost every year, conducted pogroms in the Jewish communities in the metropoles of Europe. Jews were hunted and discriminated against and beaten and killed Europe, by other Europeans living in their own midst. And yet, throughout this period from the Inquisition to modern times, every German Jew before Adolf Hitler believed that they were Germans 
Every Polish Jew believed he was Polish. They all believed in the national myths of their respective countries. And they pledged allegiance to that myth. So they were shocked when they were declared vermin by their own countrymen, by their next door neighbor. They were shocked. And what did Lebon say about the crowd? That if they were told lies, even when those lies could not be verified, in fact, as long as it reinforced their self-esteem and self-worth, they would believe anything. So your neighbor turns on you, who you grew up with, your children played with. And he turns on you, spits on you. You're like, whoa, what just happened? Hmm? It's very important to understand all that's not real is camouflage. And the state, the modern nation state, the national security state, camouflages your control and your lack of freedom with the perception of democracy. This bogus democracy then allows for fascists and racists and those who do not have the interest of people in their program, in their hearts, to rise to positions of leadership based on lies, based on manipulation of people's emotions and weaknesses. Demonizing people and reducing them to subhumans to justify the most inhumane treatment that they can visit upon you. So, people who are fleeing across the Mediterranean, see, in rickety rafts and boats looking for a better life for their children, putting everything on the line to get to Europe, are turned away like vermin, are demonized, are treated inhumanely, and some of them even enslaved as they try to cross territories that are in the throes of civil war, like Libya. Why? So there's a history that you're about to experience in real time. As these nation states become more desperate, they begin to tell more extreme lies and falsehoods in order to justify their policies and their existence. So now we're told that we're on the brink of nuclear confrontation over the Ukraine. And that the Ukraine is undergoing a serious humanitarian crisis. And millions of people have fled to Ukraine because of Russia's invasion and its ambitions, which seem to be quite vague in the Ukraine. But have you heard about Tigray? Have you heard about that part of Ethiopia that the United Nations General Secretary said is undergoing the worst humanitarian crisis 
in our time, right now that millions and millions of people are on the verge of starvation. Millions are displaced. A war is raging around them. And you can't find a peep of it, that information, in the news. Why? Because in this global village that we live in, the medium has become the message. The medium has become the message. And in this global village that we live in, technology has made it so that instant communications means that we could learn about a catastrophe or an event in real time, in a matter of minutes, while it's happening sometimes. And we could even see it sometimes on television unfold in real time. So what that means is the ability of the state to manipulate perception and transform it into reality has become ultimate. So when we thought that the internet would come along and free up our dialogues with each other over territorial boundaries and cultural lines and we said, with the internet, war might never occur anymore because people could then see the, what we have in common. The community, the global village will come together with this mass communications. Has that happened? The opposite has happened. Le Bon was right. Once a certain class, an elite, and people can get the ability to control masses of people's thoughts and actions and perceptions, they then can direct the resources and the ability and the power of those people and their ignorance to do their bidding, to keep them in power, to set them against each other. So that's what you're confronted with. You're confronted with a world in which the corporate media, who represents the elite and the 1% of this planet that's controlling the resources, is able to transmit in a matter of a millisecond its own view and perception of reality in a way that you believe it. It becomes part of the dialogue. The parameters of the debate are set by those who have an interest in making sure that the debate doesn't go against them. That's deep. So there's a left and there's a right. And you say, well, man, you know, I don't agree with the left on this here because actually it's such and such. And they said, man, you extreme left. I mean, you out on the fringe. So they have a term, extreme leftist. And you know what usually goes with that? That T word, terrorist. You see? And then if you're on the extreme right, and you're a crypto Nazi, <laughs> they don't call you a terrorist. Hmm? They call you maybe a neo-fascist. They'll call you maybe a right-wing extremist. But they won't call you a terrorist. You could fire blast 100 people in the church courtyard on Easter Sunday, and you'd just be an extreme nutcase with right-wing politics. But if you did that and you was on the left, you were either a religious fanatic or an extremist or a, terror, or, or a terrorist. Terrorism is tried, they try to apply terrorism only to those forces who understand that the white supremacist construct 
that is democratic fascism can only be defeated and destroyed when it is challenged and when people don't back down. Sadly, that brings into question the idea and the notion of revolutionary violence. Because nonviolence is the absence of violence. It's not the opposite of violence. The state has a monopoly on violence. And in America, that idea is kind of fudged because white, the white supremacist construct of America was so thick and so intense that white people in America believe that they have a right, a God-given right to kill whoever they disagree with. Now they'll tell you the opposite. No, we got freedom of speech. I'll die for your right to say what you have to say even if I disagree with it. And then the minute you disagree with them and you tell them that what they're doing is fascist or reactionary or racist, then the guns get drawn. You saw the people storming the capital of the United States. They were taking selfies. They were taking... <laughs> Because they thought that they, you know, we white. America is white. We're taking this back. This is ours. Now, could you imagine if black people had stormed the Capitol? So, the delusion that these white people have in America, that they are actually victims, and the rage that they have is actually justified is exactly what LeBron said in his book, The Crowd. How they could get people to believe a lie rather than the truth. And they, their brain breaks down if they're confronted with facts. They get cognitive dissonance. They like frozen. It's like, I guess it's something like coming to a cliff that's 100 feet high and realizing you don't have wings and you can't fly. And the bird flies right by you and you say, if you believe that, <laughs> if you say, well, I got to do is flap my arms and I'll fly. And reality is telling you, yo, it's 100 feet down. You know, the fall might not kill you, but the sudden stop will, <laughs> you know? So this is where we are today. We have plenty of people who are in positions of power and control who believe the lies that they have been told and that they have told all their lives. They believe that. And anyone that challenges that is obviously a subversive, has some ill intent, and cannot be trusted, or someone who has hatred in his heart or her heart. You see? It's very important to understand, therefore, that what we have to do in order to challenge this mind control that the state has over the masses of people through the mass media, what we have to do is go off grid. We have to have as organizations, as programs, and as projects a face-to-face -face relationship to people. Not in Facebook, not through the electronic media, Face to face. So amongst yourselves as student activists, amongst yourselves as Muslims committed to justice and humanity, you have to sit down with yourselves and develop a mechanism and a way to get your voice to people on a face to face basis. 
That means you have to develop strategies and programs that put you in the community with the people at the time that they need you there the most. Whether it's over medical attention, whether it's over treatment of the elderly, whether it's over health care, whether it's over transportation, whether it's over distribution of resources for homeless, whatever it is, you have to have a face-to-face -face relationship with other human beings. Now everybody got their face on these, on these devices. You could, if you ever look at a crowd of people standing around waiting for a train, isn't everybody looking in their cell phone? Everybody's looking in their cell phone. And if you was to go, if you were able to see everyone's cell phone, you would see everybody is looking at something different in their cell phone. So in the crowd, in that particular space, there is no cohesion. There is no uni u unity. There is very little human contact, actually. There's no human interaction. Interaction has now come through electronic devices. How many of you feel like there's something wrong if your phone dies? Let your phone die. You feel like you don't exist no more. As soon as you plug it back in, the first thing you do is you boot it up to see all the messages that you missed. Hmm? You get up in the morning, the first thing you do, not brush your teeth. First thing you do is reach over for the cell phone to see what was happening while you were sleeping. And then you might put it down real quick because you have certain bullet points that you want to check. You check them, then you put it down. Then you'll go brush your teeth. You see? And then you'll come back to your phone and do it in a little more detail. <laughs> this has become an extension of your very being in the sense that it limits your ability to communicate with other people on a face-to-face -face basis. Where, what political leader comes to a town hall and explains to his constituency or her constituents that this is why I'm taking this position? How does every, everybody feel about that? No, they have their town hall meeting on the internet, on a Zoom. They can mute you. <laughs> they can claim technical difficulty. They didn't hear you. You see? No face-to-face -face because you might... If you're talking some crap, you might get beat up. Hey man, I ain't going down there after all that stuff I talk. But you were supposed to be representing the folks here. So you ain't going to go there and talk to them face to face? Uh, things might get a little dicey. So what was you talking about then? Who you representing? Well, I'm representing the people that you know pay for my campaign. I'm representing the people that you know put money in my little you know, trust fund. Oh, so you don't even want to go down there and hang out amongst the people because they might whip your ass. Yeah, well, when voting comes around, then all the sweet stuff comes, right? They come in and they throw a little festival here. They do a little fundraiser there. They give out some candies and, you know, they, they talk good and hopefully you'll vote for them and then you won't see them again to the next cycle. This is democracy. Ain't it democracy? The Greens exist because they're environmentalists. But can they control the, 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 the oil interests that manipulate state budgets and direct state foreign policy on the down low? Can the Greens do that? We have globalization at this particular point on the level that trade and resources and human re and, 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 and human and, and human uh, capacities are all focused through these international networks, these international uh, uh, conglomerates so that we are really just cogs in the machine now. We have no power. 
People go to the bank and the bank acts like the money they got, your money, belongs to them. They're giving you a hard time getting your own money. Like you say, damn, man, maybe I should have came in here with a mask and a gun. I probably would have got quicker service. <laughs> you know? But this is your money. And it's the same way we deal with the different services. You're supposed to be paying taxes to get good transportation services. So when the transportation service breaks down, they talk to you like you work for them. But ain't we paying your salary? You have no power. So the issue now is how do we take power? How do we mobilize masses of people to understand that the perceptions that they're being fed is not the reality of why they are in the situation they're in? And if we don't do this, if we don't begin doing this, by 1922, 1924, many of the freedoms that we think we enjoy now Many of the political views that we think we're free to exercise won't exist. America is trying to move towards a Christian national, nationalist state. This is a whole generation of new white political activists who are more extreme than the so-called conservatives on the right, the, the institutional conservatives on the right. There's no distinction between neoconservatism and neoliberalism. In fact, if you look them both up, they say the exact same thing. They say the same thing. So what do you say? Well, what's the difference? Maybe the difference is like, what Malcolm X said about the Democratic and the Republican parties. He said the Republicans are like wolves with blood dripping down their jaws. And the Democrats are like foxes. But they're both canine. They're both dogs. They just have a different methodology of hunting their prey. And you are the prey. So when we talk this social democrat, democratic socialist, communist, jihadist, uh, you know, progressive. You ask him, what's a progressive? Well, you know, basically a progressive is someone that, you know, is in favor of, you know, broad-based policies that have, a, 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 you know, a, a, a relatively uh, a positive outcome for the majority of people, and it's usually something that we could try to do with a minimum amount of, 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 of budget and money and stuff like that. This, this is a progressive. Oh, yeah? Well, you know what they said in the Bible. Was it the Bible? The meek won't inherit the earth. They said the meek will inherit the earth. I'm here to tell you that they won't. The meek ain't going to get shit. Only when you speak up, only when you stand up, will you achieve anything. Being meek and trying to make, you know, your demands, um, acceptable by people who are not, who are unacceptable is an exercise in futility. So I just want to say that, and can start to conclude here, by saying that the left and the right in Europe at this time bear little distinction from each other. We have to create, your generation has to create, a new political paradigm in Europe, a new awakening, a new consciousness in Europe. The same mission that young people 
in the U.S. and in Africa have. Africans your age in the U.S. have the same mission, to reclaim Africa for Africans and African people, to stop and halt the exploitation of African resources, to build a continent that could feed its people, give them employment, administer good health to them. So there are you in Africa. And that's your mission here, to do the exact same thing. And in the US, to do that exact same thing. This is your generation's time to shine. This is your struggle, and this is your time. And these old, tired capitalists and exploiters and autocrats and criminals and gangsters that are running shit, they have to step aside. And if they don't want to willingly and peacefully, or let's say in an orderly fashion, move into the dustbin of history, you have to help them along. You have to give them one of them, what I would, I guess you could call it a political stroller. So they could stroll their ass on out of here. These, this nation state that exists now does not exist for the benefit of its people. It exists to enrich and maintain the power of elites and autocrats and corrupt individuals whose only interest is to maintain their power and control over you and over the resources that your common labor creates. So I'm just saying, don't be shy. And don't rely on electronic media. Remember that in the global village, you're just as powerful as any newspaper. Back in the day, you know, the New York Times and the London Express, all these newspapers, they had, they the ones that could get out the news in the morning and circulate it to 1.5 million people. You could do the same thing now on the internet. If Kanye West could sell a song on the internet and get 1.5 1, 1. million hits, and that knucklehead ain't saying nothing, I know you can get 1.5 million hits if y'all organize yourselves. How did all of y'all find out that the other place was canceled and all of y'all are here now? I'm quite sure they canceled it at the last moment, hoping that people wouldn't know where to go. They say, oh man, we missed this. But instead, we've got, probably got more people here than we would have had in the original place. So how did you do that? They weaponized data. They weaponized the algorithms. You have to weaponize your relationship to each other. You have to weaponize, in many respects, your humanity. You have to stand for those who are, are oppressed and exploited and weak. You have to stand for them as the Muslims are commanded to stand for those who are weak and who are oppressed and who are hungry. And Christians are told to feed those who are hungry, to house those who are poor, hmm? to help and administer to the sick. This is Christian values. But what are these Christian nationalists talking about? They're not talking about that. When it comes to migrant people, they're not taking them in. They're not giving them food, giving them shelter, showing them love. They're putting them in camps at the border and trying to turn them back into the desert. Christian values. You see? So we each have our own sense of mission 
But we each have to begin to not only talk to each other, but refuse to let the enemy of the sun define who our enemies are for us. So if you attend a rally against the European settler state of Israel, an apartheid state, a racist state, with members of the BDS, you shouldn't be restricted from attending that protest because you are a communist who oppose oppression and exploitation and imperialism of people and you believe the same thing they do because the state said that you're radical if you have them march with you. And we're the ones that pay for the march. You know, Nestle's Chocolate Company sponsored the march. You know. So they don't want to be accused of having, quote, supporters of terrorism marching in solidarity, you know, with, with wholesome political liberals and progressives. How could you let your enemy define your friends and your allies for you? The only way you will is if you're being paid by the enemy to do so. I hate to say it, but that's called movement encapsulation. It's a strategy of empire. Divide and conquer is one strategy, but encapsulation of energy and mass consciousness and mass movements is another strategy. So you set up an organization for young people that embodies all of those things that young people want to do, and everybody joins it. And after they join it and they become members of that organization, then you take that organization and you turn its politics towards the interests of those who are in power. And then those who see it will fall out, and those who want to still try to work with it will stay in it. You've been encapsulated. It's a strategy, and it's effective because it's based on the false notion that the perception that's being created by the state and by the mass media and by the common dialogue is, in fact, reality. So you have Zionists who, so, who oppose the European settler state of Israel because they maintain that they are democratically inclined. They, they should be a one state that has a democracy and all people are treated equal. Now check that out. So why couldn't the state be Palestinian and everybody be treated equal? Oh, it's got to be Israeli because these folks that care, well, they already here, you know, we already, you know, we already chilling and shit. You see what I'm saying? So that's why it's got to be Israel. You know, that's why it gotta be Israel. Uh-huh. So you can go take people's land, you can go rip them off, and then when you realize that you can't hold on to it the way you want to hold on to it, and you want to include them then in the process of the political running of the state, but it's still your state. You see? So, to change History based on the presumptions of those who held back the development of people is the wrong approach. South Africa tried it. South Africa tried to get rid of apartheid without nationalizing its resources. Because the agreement for apartheid to quit was already made with the international monetary uh, finance institutions of the world 
with the gold centers of gold production and gold evaluation of the world, these centers had already agreed that once the political state of apartheid was dismantled, that the economic relationship between that state and the rest of the community of nations would not change. In other words, the 90% of the land that was owned by European settlers today, they still own 70% of the land. De Beers still controls the mines. In fact, miners get shot in South Africa for going on strike sometimes under the government that dismantled apartheid. When you base your change for revolutionary justice and freedom for the masses of your people based on the system or accepting the system's propositions and perceptions as being that basis for change, you're going to ultimately fail. This is why today in Africa, all of those government, all of these governments today that, were, that are run by the liberation movements that ran the colonizers out of Africa, whether in Mozambique, whether in Guinea-Bissau, whether in Angola, whether in South Africa, all of these movements, the MPLA, the uh, uh, UNIGC, the FLIMO, all of these organizations, these governments now have become some of the most reactionary governments in Africa. Why? Because when they took power, they had a legitimate perception and relationship to the people, but they had to deal with the community of nations that they had stepped into. And the community of nations had its rules, it had its guidelines, and it had the game. You had to play the game, or you weren't going to remain in power. So now, the mineral resources of, of Mozambique, once again, are being contested in the north by, by um, European and, and American interests. The Chinese are now um, in, it's a whole new ball game. So what happened to the revolutionaries? What happened to the heirs of Amokar Cabral and Kwame Nkrumah and Jomo Kenyatta? Go look at, go look at the elections. Huh? Go look at how their people are living. Go look at the development. So don't think that the moment that you become successful that everything is going to change for the better. Just understand that the only reason you are in this struggle is not only to win, but be in it, period. There's no freedom without struggle. There's no advancement without struggle. In fact, it's the struggle that gives you self-worth and self-value. And that's the most important message that I can give people today. You have to stand for what you believe. And you have to encourage the best in those around you who are trying to do the right thing. And you have to understand that their experience is also of value to you. So it's good to sit down with people from another organization and they'll tell you, well, this is why we feel this about that. And they have a history for coming to those feelings. Now it's your job using an analytical method, whether it's dialectical, or rather it's theological, to say, well, we didn't look at the, that history like that. This is how we saw that history. And now you can see what the contradictions might be. You can see how we could believe this and you can believe that. So now we can reconcile those differences and come to some type of unity of purpose 
and direction and action. Rather than taking a dogmatic position that, well, it's our way or the highway, you know, what you said, I don't, you know, I don't want to hear. You see? You have to draw a clear demarcation line between your enemy and yourself and your principles and your organization. But that clear demarcation line that you draw between the enemy is not the same demarcation line between you and those on the same side of the barricade as you. Those on the same side of the barricade as you have more in common with you than you have with your enemy. And that's very important to understand as things become more confused, more chaotic, and events occur and begin to happen very rapidly. So, I just want to say that I'm glad that I had the opportunity to come and talk to you. I hope some of the things that I said made sense. If anything that I've said was uh, mistaken or wrong, it's solely attributable to me. And if anything that I said was true, that was right, and that was righteous, it belongs to all of us. I got it from you. And that's all I have to say right now. And thank you.